God, or substance consisting of infinite attributes, each one of which expresses eternal and infinite essence, necessarily exists. This quote by Spinoza describes the eleventh proposition in a series of logical arguments that describes the existence of God as logically necessary. Spinoza argues that God indeed exists, is eternal, expresses every conceivable attribute to an infinite degree, and is the absolute origin and transitive cause of all things. If we can accept Spinoza's logic, the resulting implications upon one's world view and values can be quite pronounced. I am sure as the listener you can already imagine the great extent of what such a God means for us. Immediately one is confronted, for instance, that with this God we have described, everything in existence is inherently divine, that is to say, originates from and is a part of God. Therefore, human suffering, pain, and even evil is part of God's nature, just as much as pleasure, peace, and kindness is also part of his nature. Beyond immediate implications, this strikes a resemblance to Jung's description of the psyche in its totality, especially in his discourse describing the human capacity for evil as equally important to its capacity for good amongst his broader discussion of the psyche as consisting of equal parts in opposites. No tree, it is said, can grow to heaven unless its roots reach down to hell. Spinoza's perspective also resembles the ancient Chinese concept of the yin-yang, in which the totality of being is comprised of opposites. According to Spinoza, God is everything, not just what we see as good. Ancient Chinese philosophy teaches that out of the original state of undifferentiated, absolute and infinite potential, which is to say, the oneness before duality, the opposites that define the nature of reality emerged, which is collectively symbolized as the yin-yang. Indeed, this language strikes a familiar tone with that of Spinoza's propositions. For Spinoza, God is both infinitely evil and infinitely good. He is the ultimate original one, in which all things possible first originated in. This, of course, quite violently challenges the social norms of our time. To suggest the entirety of reality, and thereby even what we understand as evil, as a divine part of God and reality as a whole, is abrasive, to say the least. However, if this perspective is correct, we find ourselves, through Spinoza, a path to confronting the true nature of divinity in its totality, and by extension, an encounter with the negative quality of existence as necessary and divine. If I am to be allowed some looseness of comparison, we have arrived at the task of psychic integration that Jung called upon as vital to psychic wholeness, but by means of logical deduction from first principles, instead of an observation of psychology and its nature. Thus, integrating the shadow and the totality of man's primal energies in our psyche may not only be necessary to achieve psychic wholeness, but may also be a reflection of reality in its entirety, and thereby allow us to perceive it more accurately. But perhaps this is to be expected. Human beings, after all, arose out of this very universe Spinoza has described. Naturally, as beings arising out of this universe, we would find no exception to the laws that govern its nature in ourselves. Thus, exploring the totality of the human soul is as much a journey within as it is a journey in coming to know nature and reality as it truly is. As such, Spinoza's propositions grant a profound significance to inner psychological growth and understanding, in that they affirm the vital importance of psychic maturity in constructing a clear and accurate conception of reality. Given this perspective, is it of any surprise that Albert Einstein, father of spatial relativity, stated, 
I believe in Spinoza's God, who reveals himself in the orderly harmony of what exists, not in a God who concerns himself with fates and actions of human beings. But what exactly is Spinoza's method of proof? How can one make an absolute statement for the existence of God? Is such a thing even possible? Spinoza goes even further than this and, using logical argument, builds a series of qualities that God necessarily holds. His method of proof is as follows. Spinoza firstly defines something called substance. Substance, to Spinoza, is that which is in itself and conceived through itself. In other words, that the conception of which does not need the conception of another thing from which it must be formed. Spinoza argues that such a substance must necessarily exist, because everything must have a cause or reason for its existence, and that reason must lie either outside of that thing or within it. In Spinoza's words, that which cannot be conceived through another must be conceived through itself. Thus, because everything necessarily came from something else, there must exist a first substance. To Spinoza, if one accepts reality as such, one must also accept this position. Cause and effect is an absolute principle in our reality, and so to reject this necessity of a first substance is to reject reality as it presents itself to us. This is an important point because the existence of a first substance as logically necessary is the core of Spinoza's proof of God's existence. These premises then lead Spinoza to claim that God necessarily exists, and his method of proof is as follows. Our reality necessitates the existence of a substance or a first cause for each thing. This is because in our universe everything is finite to some degree. Therefore, we can say with confidence that there must exist a certain number of substances as the first causes for each thing in our universe. But how are these substances defined? What makes them different to each other? And why are they not all part of the same thing? Spinoza points out that there are only two ways that substances can be differentiated. By their attributes, that is to say characteristics, or by their modes. Or forms. Here I will define exactly what characteristics and modes are, and why they are the only means by which substances can be told apart. Spinoza defines attributes as that which the intellect perceives of a substance, as if constituting its essence, and defines modes as the affections of a substance. Because there is nothing in reality about a thing outside of its nature and its consequences, these are the sole means by which a substance may be differentiated. For instance, consider the existence of a wax candle. It has color, texture, scent, shape and solidity. However, when placed near a fire, all of these qualities change completely. Here, assuming wax as a substance, the color, texture, and scent of wax can be thought of as modes, which can change. The essential essence of the wax is, however, contained in its molecular structure, which cannot change and still be called wax. Thus, the molecular structure of wax is its attribute, as it is what the intellect perceives to constitute the essence of wax. Outside of the modes and attributes of wax, nothing about wax can exist. So, if we assume for the sake of demonstration that wax was a substance, we could say that its molecular structure is its attribute and its changeable properties are its modes. Given this, how would we reliably differentiate wax to, say, a mushroom? To be sure, we could not perfectly rely on their modes, that is to say, their color, texture or shape. Rather, to be sure there are indeed different substances, we would have to compare the molecular structure of the two, that is to say, compare their attributes, because attributes constitute the essence of a substance. In other words, because a mode is merely a consequence and expression of a substance and its attributes, and does not define it, 
it cannot be used to differentiate substances. In Spinoza's words, substance is by nature prior to its affections. Thus, modes are invalid means of differentiating substances and their attributes. This leaves us with attributes themselves as the sole means of defining different substances. Thus, there cannot exist in nature two different substances with the same attribute, because these are necessarily the same substance. This is Spinoza's fifth proposition, that is, in nature, there cannot be two or more substances of the same nature or attribute. One could argue in the wax analogy that there could be waxes of the same attributes side by side in space, and by this analogy, multiple substances in existence with the same attributes. However, there is only one wax, regardless of how many forms it exists in. Spinoza points out that multiple substances with the same attributes cannot exist in space because substances exist prior to space itself. If space were a container for substances, then other substances would be dependent on it for existence, which is a contradiction. Substances cannot depend on anything except themselves for existence, as they are a first cause. Here it may become apparent that the analogy of wax as a substance is insufficient. Wax does not exist prior to space and time, and its existence is not contained within itself. The existence of wax is predicated on the existence of atomic particles, space, time, and so forth, and so it cannot be considered a substance in the way Spinoza describes substance. However, the wax analogy is effective at describing what a mode and attribute is in relation to a substance, as long as you keep this context in mind. Consider what has been demonstrated with the wax analogy, and now replace wax with first cause, that is to say substance, and the analogy becomes effective. So now we've established that substances cannot be differentiated by modes, and only by attributes, because substances exist prior to its modes, and are not defined by them. But here Spinoza argues that even attributes cannot be used to distinguish substances, and his reasoning is as follows. Since substances necessarily exist independently of space and time, and their cause is contained within themselves, it is in their nature to exist. In other words, it is impossible for a substance to not exist. This means that every conceivable and possible substance must necessarily exist, unless there is a reason that negates their existence. Therefore, a substance expressing an infinite number of attributes must exist necessarily. This is Spinoza's God, a first cause expressing every possible attribute. Here I should ask the reader to pause and consider the implications of what has been discovered. We have arrived by logical deduction at the existence of an infinite substance expressing every conceivable attribute of reality. There are additional proofs listed by Spinoza in his book Ethics but each proof depends fundamentally on the same argument I have just described. So now it has been established that a substance expressing infinite attributes exists necessarily. But what about every other substance? Does not the existence of other substances detract from the importance of God? That is to say, if there exist many substances sharing the attributes of God, then God cannot be considered as necessary or particularly potent. However, if you recall, we concluded that two substances of the same attribute cannot exist. If it is the case that God is substance consisting of infinite attributes, then his necessary existence implies that no other substance expressing any attributes can exist as distinct or separate to God. This is because any substance expressing an attribute would have that attribute in common with God and therefore cannot be conceived as separate to God, just as two substances cannot share the same attributes and be considered distinct. Therefore, we can say with certainty that there cannot exist any substances apart from the one substance expressing infinite attributes, that is to say, 
God. As well as necessarily existing, Spinoza points out God must be eternal. This is because in order for a substance to end at some point in time, it must be limited by a separate substance of the same attribute. Once again, this would mean the existence of two substances of the same attribute, which is impossible as discussed previously. Therefore, God, being a substance, is necessarily eternal. A similar proof lies in the nature of a substance to exist, which means that there is no instance in time in which it does not exist, meaning it is eternal. Additionally, Spinoza points out that God is not only the original cause of all things, but also of their continuation. In other words, all things not only originate from God, but are also sustained through Him. In Spinoza's words, God is the imminent and not the transitive cause of all things. This is because, fundamentally, there exists nothing other than God, His attributes and His modes. As God exists prior to His modes, that is to say, His effects or consequences, so the modes of God are not separate to His being. In other words, this means that if God were to cease existing, so would everything in existence, in much the same way that the expressions on our face would vanish if we vanished. Classic Western thought posits God as the creator to the universe rather than being the universe itself. However, to conceive of God as creating the universe is to imply God acts on and created the universe as separate to himself. For Spinoza, this is an impossibility, because there is nothing other than God. Therefore, God cannot be separated from anything in existence, and his existence is all that is and is inseparable from it. In this way, all things are sustained through God and depend on Him for the continuation of existence. And so, to summarize, we have established that there necessarily must exist a first cause for each thing in reality. These first causes we call substances. Substances have their causes contained within themselves. In other words, it is in their nature to exist. As it is in the nature of a substance to exist, that is to say it exists necessarily, we can say that every conceivable substance must also exist. Of these substances, a substance expressing infinite attributes must therefore exist. However, since two substances sharing the same attribute cannot exist, only one substance expressing infinite attributes can exist as this substance negates the existence of all other substances. This substance is also necessarily eternal and cannot come to an end or cease to exist under any means. And so, Spinoza arrives at the necessary existence of God as an eternal first cause consisting of infinite attributes in which all things originate and are sustained.